In May this year, Google gave a demonstration of their new artificial intelligence technology called Duplex. It's able to make telephone calls and have conversations without any human help. It's incredible technology. But the part of their demonstration that generated the biggest response might surprise you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. How oh, can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even though we were witnessing a computer having a completely autonomous conversation with a human, the part that really shocked everybody was that tiny, short, mm-hmm. <laughs> now, why would such an insignificant non-word be such a surprising thing to hear from a computer? Because those tiny words are actually an essential part of human fluent conversation. So, if fluency is what you want, keep watching. The objective of most learners is fluency, to have a fluent conversation. And there's a lot of focus on individual output and input. But conversation isn't something that you do alone. It is a collaboration that requires two or more people to perform an intricate and precisely timed dance that is as old as language itself. And the secret to this dance is taking turns. Don't let it go Chasing a dream Say you do there are five very simple rules to this dance that we must all observe to have fluent conversation. One, signal that you want to speak. Two, recognize the right moment to speak. Three, use the appropriate structure to take control. Four, recognize other people's desire to speak. And five, give up control. Good conversation is about people taking turns to produce something beautiful together. The timing of this dance between people in a conversation is extremely precise. In English, the average space between turns in a conversation is 200 milliseconds. That's really fast. But actually, that's not the most interesting thing. You see, if I show you an object and ask you to tell me what it is, the time it takes for your eyes to process this image and then for your brain to go and retrieve that vocabulary and sound information ready to speak is 600 milliseconds. But the average space between turns is only 200 milliseconds. That means that we actually prepare to speak before the other person finishes. And we also know exactly when they're going to finish. But how do we know that? Knowing when the other person is about to stop speaking is an ability that comes with practice. So naturally, native speakers are really good at it. And we can test your skills with a really simple two-part experiment. So, for the first part, I'm going to play a sound. Now, as soon as that sound stops, I want you to press the pause button as quickly as possible. And then, have a look at your reaction time on the clock below. Ready? Most native speakers reacted in about 800 milliseconds. Quite slow, actually, not fast enough for turns in conversation. 
So now for part two. This time I'm going to say a sentence. And again, when I finish that sentence, I want you to press that pause button as quickly as possible. Ready? I like pizza because it looks good, it smells good, and it tastes good. Most native speakers reacted to that in just 200 milliseconds, the same as in conversation. So it's not just about sound finishing, it's about lots of different things. The ability to detect when the other person is about to finish speaking is really important because of a simple rule in English, the one second rule. In English, we don't like silence. Silence is uncomfortable. In fact, research shows that silences longer than just one second indicate three very bad things. Either you don't understand what the other person is saying, you don't like what the other person is saying, or you are about to say something negative. Now, if you do have those long pauses in your conversation turns, we need to eliminate them. If you want to eliminate those long pauses and have a really fluent conversation, there are four essential things to learn. The first one is how to take control, how to take your turn to speak. The second one is how to hold on to that control so you can continue expressing yourself and saying everything you want to say. The third one is to pass control, how you can finish your turn. And finally, how to support control to help the other person to continue speaking. Now, obviously there are non-verbal ways that we can do this, like with gestures and eye contact, but I'm going to focus on language. So the first thing is taking control, and there are three ways you can do that. So, the first way is to use a buffer. Buffers are those meaningless, no-content words like, you know, and well, and um, that create a buffer. They create that space that allows you to start your turn. You can also use competitive interruption. You don't want to do this too often, otherwise you will seem rude and like you're not listening. But it's also a great strategy for taking control. And finally, reinforces like, yeah, and really, and wow. By reinforcing, by supporting their story, again, it gives you that opportunity to, to come in and take your turn. The next one is holding control, so you can continue expressing yourself. Now, again, you can use buffers, like, or something, uh, and again, by using a buffer, by filling that space with a sound, it indicates that, you know, you're not ready for that other person to come in, that you're, you're still in the flow of your, of your conversation. And another thing you could do is simultaneous talking. So basically when, when they try to come in, they think you've finished, they see the space and they try to come in, you continue talking at the same time. And then normally the other person will stop. So again, the same as with competitive interruption, you don't want to do simultaneous talking a lot because it can seem rude. The next one is passing control, when you've said everything that you want to say. Now, the first way you can do that is using your voice with intonation or pitch or loudness. By elongating that final syllable, by dropping your pitch, or your loudness, your volume, they're all great ways to indicate that you finished speaking. <laughs> the next one is buffers. So again, different types of buffers like, you get the idea, or and so on, and anyway, all indicate that you're ready for the other person to take their turn in the conversation. And finally, asking questions. I, I don't think that there's any better way 
to tell the other person that you want them to speak than by asking a question. And it's also, in general, just a great way to elevate conversation to the next level by asking questions. Now, what's a really important way that's bad for passing control? Silence. Don't do it. The final thing is supporting control. Now, I can't stress this enough. When you enter into a conversation with somebody, you enter into an obligation to support them when they're speaking. It's not just about waiting for your turn to speak. It's about this dance, this magic cooperation. So the first way you can support them, again, is with reinforcers like, oh my God, amazing. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next thing you can do is ask for clarification. Really? So on, on the right? Ah, oh, you mean like the big one? Okay, so you, this is a type of cooperative interruption. Cooperative interruptions might be when you help them to finish their sentences. Or maybe you're adding some extra details that you think will help them to tell their story better. Supporting control, super important. Please don't ignore it. The consequences of not following these conversation rules can actually be quite severe. If in a conversation you never pass control, then you could be labeled as a motor mouth who never shuts up and everybody is going to avoid conversation with you. Conversely, if you never take control, then you could be labeled as passive and timid and not get that job that you want. In general, it could mean that you have difficulty participating in conversations and expressing yourself and integrating in society. But there is actually one other consequence, which is much more important for the language learner. In 2000, researchers from the University of Victoria performed a very simple experiment. They invited people to come into their laboratory and tell a stranger an exciting story from their lives. But there was a twist. The strangers who were listening to the stories had to press a button under the table every time they heard the letter T. Now, normally when a person is listening to a story, they produce a specific type of response every 27 seconds. But because they were so distracted by listening for the letter T and by pressing the button, they only produced this response every 12 and a half minutes. But it's not the effect on the listener that we're interested in. The person telling the story wasn't receiving all of the normal feedback that the story was interesting or surprising and being understood and they should continue. They weren't being supported by the listener. The effect was that they became less fluent, less coherent, and they paused and hesitated more. The listener actually had an effect on the speaker's fluency. You control the fluency of the other person. But the really negative effect is that it makes the person who you're trying to speak to more difficult for you to understand. Obviously, a really important question is, can you learn and practice those skills? Absolutely yes. Now, I'm going to show you a few ways that you can do that. Now, the first one is if you want to practice alone. And you're going to practice by utilizing the noticing hypothesis. Basically, by paying attention, by noticing, you're going to increase your abilities. So, all you need is an interview. Okay? So, you can go on YouTube on the internet and find an interview. Now, don't use a film or a television series because they are scripted. It's not natural dialogue. You want something spontaneous. And what you're going to do is 
simply use the pause button. Okay? So what you do is you watch the interview, right? And at a moment when you think the person is going to pass their turn, when you think they are getting ready to stop speaking and they want the other person to speak, you pause the video. Just pause it. And then think to yourself, okay, what would I say or how would I take control of the conversation at that moment? And then unpause the video and see if you were correct. See if, in fact, they were getting ready to stop speaking and they were trying to pass that, that turn on. And you can also do the same thing with your continuers when you're trying to encourage the other person to continue speaking. So when Mr. Tom Hanks here is in the middle of telling his story and I feel like maybe I should say, really? Ah, uh, mm-hmm. Then I pause the video and I decide which one I think is the most appropriate. And then I unpause the video and see if I was correct. Now, you don't have to use video. Video is good because it has all of the other elements like hand gestures and eye contact. But you could do this with a radio interview or a podcast with any spontaneous speech. And the best thing, it's totally free and you don't need any special resources. But of course, the best way to practice is with another person. And these days, there is no excuse. You can always find someone to practice with online. So let me show you a few ways that you can practice with a partner or a group of people. So the first one is very simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to count to 20 mm -hmm. and we're going to take turns doing the counting. Yeah. So I'm going to pass control to you and then you pass back to me and we're going to be using maybe eye contact and gestures and our tone of voice to pass control. And the idea is to make that, that gap as small as possible. Okay? You ready? Uh, yeah, yeah. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Twenty. Ah, I like that. And so, you know, it's a great way to just practice some of that, that intonation that helps the other person understand when, when you want to pass control. And it's also great to help you understand, you know, when it's your turn to take control. Now, maybe uh, with, with doing the numbers, that could get boring pretty quickly, right? So you can, you can do the same thing in a different way by telling a story. Now, you could use some story cubes if you have them, or you can just, um, just tell a story and take control and pass control. So, for example, um, I'll start. Okay. One day, there was a boy walking along the street, and he saw this really beautiful tree. It was so beautiful that he decided that he would count every leaf on every branch of the tree. And as soon as he finished counting every leaf and every branch on every tree, he went back to his house. But when he, when he arrived home, he felt very sad because he enjoyed being in the countryside and he didn't want to stay in his house. He loved the countryside because, because um, there was lots of sun, hot sun in the countryside that would dry his clothes. Mm -hmm. And so during the storytelling, right, so the idea is to make that space as small as possible. Mm -hmm. And also... Um, um, you can use maybe some of those um, those continues when I'm trying to help you to keep talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of those things you can incorporate. Now, the final way to practice after you've done some numbers and some stories is to use this incredible worksheet game from the website Tefletastic. Okay, and basically on the first page you have a list of all of the different types of turn taking. So interrupting, stopping other people from interrupting, taking the turn back, offering other people, etc., etc. And then you have specific vocabulary, set phrases and vocabulary for every single one of these of these functions. It's it's a great it's a really great resource. The the link is down 
in the description box, okay? So let's practice the first one, interrupting. Interrupting. Okay. So I'm going to start talking and you can interrupt using any of these phrases. Oh, this is all from interrupting? Yep, they're all from interrupting. Wow, so you can see here that this is all the vocabulary just for one uh -huh. of the, the boxes on the first page. So it's a quite a lot, right? It's a lot, it's a lot. And you know, no one expects you to memorize all of this. You know, choose two of your favorites. Done. Uh, and the rest will come with time. Um, so, uh, after I drop you at the swimming pool, my plan is to go could, into... Could I just say something though? Mm. I think it would be better if you go to the school first and then to the swimming pool Really? After. But, um, I, I don't know because I need to, to do some filming when I, when I get there. I need to film another class and I think if I go to the swimming pool first and drop you off, then I'll be free But to... in a minute, in a minute, wait a minute. I think it's, I just think that's a bad idea. <laughs> You're so bad at interrupting, oh my God. <laughs> As with most things in language, there is no mystery about how to perfect the delicate dance of conversation. It's just practice. But I hope that now you are aware of the magic power of those ums and ahs. Well, I hope you found this class interesting. If you would like to support free English education, then there are two ways you can do that. One is you can become my patron on Patreon, and the second one is you can buy some very stylish Kangaroo English merchandise. And if you would like to see any more videos about the English language, then don't forget to subscribe. I'm Christian, this is Kangaroo English. I'll see you in class. Don't let go Chasing a dream Where you